My name is Chuck Wilhelm. I'm the moderator of this program. I'm a, uh, in charge of business development for Enlight Energy, energy efficient lighting company. We have three panelists. The first of the three panelists is Terry Clark. I'll introduce him as we go to try to speed things up here. Terry is the founder and chairman of Fine Light, a provider of energy efficiency lighting systems. I would, re since we're a little late, I would refer you to the bio, which gives you a little more information on it. Terry, do you want to step up here and do your presentation? Thank you, Chuck. So we'll load this up, and uh, uh, as it's loading, uh, this is uh, a, a session where we're going to start at the specific and then, uh, then really go up to the uh, general. So uh, I, was, I was asked to say, hey, um, Fine Light makes very high efficient light fixtures. Our fancy word is luminaires. And we make light fixtures with the best quality Super T8 fluorescence. We make light fixtures with, with LEDs. And so people come to us and say, hey, we got a lot of questions. Which is better? Which is going to last longer? You heard life cycle testing today. So um, that's what we're going to talk about is really uh, a straight talk in, in this uh, LED world. So if you haven't seen a Super T8 lamp, uh, what inch diameter is above your head right now? You know, and they've gotten good. Over the last 10 years, these lamps last 80,000 hours. They put out 3,600 lumens, and good news, LEDs. You haven't seen an LED. Oh, I've got See this little LED light engine. They're getting kind of pretty good. So the question is, hey, which, which way should I be going if I'm planning a building? I'm doing a corporate retrofit. So let's, let's look at it. Are LEDs more efficient? Well, you know, it's a big pack of LEDs. It's, it's a new technology. The very best of the best LEDs are getting slightly better, about 10, 12% better than the very best fluorescence. But don't fall in the trap because this thing does no useful work. And this doesn't do any useful work. It needs a driver. It, it needs to get power from the, the building. It needs to be in a light fixture that, that deals with glare and deals with activity. So the real question is, hey, how does a luminaire or light fixture compare to a light fixture? And this is where you really get into the line. And, and, and this is all going to be online. So these are really reference slides. But basically, the gap when you're choosing an LED light fixture can be 58 lumens per watt. So think of that like a, like a car, 58 miles a gallon, or 115. Your range is huge. So if you're dealing with a, a designer or an architect and they have an aesthetic, you all need to ask them, what are the implications of those choices? Am I down toward the 58 lumen, or am I up really at, at, at the high end, and is the high end a glare bomb? Yeah, I got my miles per gallon, but it's just hilarious can be. Uh, TH are more mature, it's a narrower range. So the very best LEDs, maybe 10% better, but if you don't have a guide, check it out. Four out of five times you're going to make a mistake. If you can't sort good and bad, don't have an expert, 80% of the time you're going to guess wrong. But how about long life? All of you have heard, hey, these are semiconductor things, long life, right? Again, it's a very mixed message. These fluorescent lamps last about 80,000 hours to 90% light output. And then they fail, they turn off. They just stop working, like some of these up here. LEDs don't do that. They dim and dim and dim like fading blue jeans. And and any of you who have daughters or nieces, you have a heck of a debate. When did blue jean reach end of life? You know, you're preppy, you're like, knees, I, I can't take much light loss. They end quick. You're down at the, the ripped blue jeans, you have other debates. You know, this is the way LEDs go. They don't turn off. 
So again, you have to know in this very, very wide range. It's new technology, but there is no silver bullet there. So then you get into, okay, how about life cycle cost? And, and this is where you get into their, their lies and their damn lies. The, the very best LED luminaires have extraordinarily long lives when you run them cool, when you really engineer it right, we can run full on for about 12 to 15 years with no maintenance person ever touching it. Other LED-based luminaires are not serviceable, not repairable, and the message to a Stanford or an end user is don't worry about this, right? How many of you are using 10-year-old cell phones right now, right? Hey, this is semiconductor technology. In seven years, the world will be great. Don't worry about it. You'll just throw these away, and it's not a big deal. How many of you know that you can't throw this away? It's seismically connected to the building structure by law. You cannot remove that without getting a big ladder, moving a ceiling tile, mechanically unhooking a side. This 12-gauge wire was never made to be unhooked. It comes out looking like a pigtail of a, of, a, of a pig. So you kind of have a $100 an hour electrician unweaving it, but it's got to be up twice. So then I move another ceiling tile and I take it off. But then I've got power to it, right? I got to unhook the power. I'm disposing it. If I cut power to this room, it gets dark. I got to bring in a whole nother light source. Then I take that, I give it to a, uh, 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 an apprentice who walks it to the back end, you walk in a new one, you're talking four or five hundred dollars to replace a disposable light fixture instead of your budget is built on maybe eight dollars to replace a lamp. Do you think that might have consequence to a school district or a health care provider when suddenly in seven years I'm looking at four hundred bucks, not eight? And, and that's why these are ugly. These are bad things, and they're being promoted by A-plus companies because I don't think they understand what's going on. The, the bad is these light engines are going to work about as, as good as a, as a fluorescent. This is 3 bucks. This is 18 Why would I ask my, my client to spend 18 bucks? instead of three bucks if they're gonna last the same time and they have the same high quality lighting. So you better know how you can sort the good from the bad and the ugly. The good news is it's kind of easy. In the lighting industry, there's a, uh, a, a new nonprofit called Design Light Consortium. They test it, they make sure you have the data, they make sure the utilities are happy, there's no uh, problems. Make sure they're dimmable. Why? Because demand response is coming. We're going to need to prepare for the controllable space. Put them in today. Even if you don't fully dim them, it's easy to retrofit them. Uh, L90 is, is the buzzwords in the industry. Make sure you'll have 90% light maintenance at 80,000 hours. Make sure they're serviceable and get a 10 calendar year warranty. If you work with your architect, you work with your internal folks, that is the threshold. But then people say, well, hey, semiconductor technology, don't worry, it's easy to control, right? No, what's controlled is the driver. I can dim fluorescent lamps, I can dim LED, I can use proprietary, I can use open architectures. You can control either of these equally well. There isn't any magic semiconductor bullet that puts a computer on the chip next to this. And that's not going to happen for a decade. So what's the final uh, message is, is look at the lighting plan first. Uh, best practice, and some of my colleagues will talk about this, is about a half a watt a square foot. It's been demonstrated time and time again. Did anybody count the lights in this ceiling? This was built about 12 years ago. We're running about 1.5 watts a square foot here, so we're putting three times the energy you need in this training room right now than with today's best practice. So the message is put task lights on the desk. That's what the aging eye needs. Put a little light on the wall. 
When you do that, your connected load, your lighting load will go down to half a watt a square foot. And my final message is, is use absolute metrics. Please don't fall into the trap of these percentage discount things you read about in energy news. Oh, I'm gonna save 40% energy. They don't tell you the baseline. If you're at half a watt a square foot, you're doing really well. And if you're not, start asking the questions, why? Because that's just a huge cost. Finally, uh, again, this is going to be online. Here are the, uh, the great links. You can get to these through Finelight, but uh, U.S. Department of Energy, Solid State Lighting. Many of these presentations are online. And uh, so we would encourage you, again, to dig into the data. The good news is, if you're in that top 2%, every benefit you can dream of is going to come back to you. But you want a guide. You need a guide at this point in time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Terry. Our next speaker is going to be Kelly Cunningham. Kelly is the Outreach Director at the University of California, Davis uh, Lighting Technology Center. And Kelly is responsible for marketing and outreach at the center's research and technology demonstration projects. And she leads many of the efforts to deploy new energy saving technologies into the broader markets. I would refer you to her bio for more information. So while I'm loading my presentation, if I could see a show of hands real quickly on who here would consider themselves a lighting expert? Couple? How about a lighting novice? I'm learning about it. All right, the majority audience, so that helps me kind of frame it. So CLTC does a lot of things. Um, we are a lighting research lab at UC Davis, and but what we do best is attempt to survey the landscape and put out things that are applicable broadly across different groups of end users. And for today, uh, and I have a lot of information about that on our website, you can contact me later on your specific need, but what I'm going to do today in the 15 minutes I have is try to expand a little bit on what Terry was saying in terms of LEDs, are they ready? Maybe point out some places where we're trying them or we're seeing good results and where they may be ready, but emphasize, um, and these are those places, you know, exterior and interior, of course then that covers all built environment spaces. Um, but what I want to emphasize, and if you're a novice or an expert, this will either serve as a reminder or as Kelly's lesson that I hope you leave with if you start checking your email and tune out right now, it's the right source with the right luminaire with the right controls for the application. So this echoes what Terry was saying about bringing in an expert or bringing in a designer or just considering this as a, a holistic effort that uh, lighting is part of your energy infrastructure. It's not just one piece that you can plug something new in and that's it. And it's part of the infrastructure. It needs to be continually revisited to make sure you're maximizing and driving uh, towards that half a watt per square foot and then below. Because that may be our best practice today, but there's always a tomorrow. And that energy is an evolving and continual story. So if nothing else, it's not just, whoa, that's awesome, we can get rid of this right now and replace with LED and we're done. And LED is the last thing. We don't know that either. It's the whole system we need to look at. So I'm gonna dive in and look at a few projects where we are using LEDs right now. Some places we see great opportunity for what's available on the market. And then I'll talk a little bit about other things as we go. So one project I'd like to direct your attention to is UC Davis's recently executed uh, networked exterior uh, project that we just did with over 1,400 points today of connected light using a wireless RF network on campus uh, that does more than just energy benefits. If we just look at the things that these 1,400 points replaced, and if we just look at energy savings and that percentage that Terry uh, talked about, we're saving 70% approximately over what we have before. But really, when we get past that number and start looking at other things, like what can we do with 1,400 points of occupancy data? What can we do with light as a communication device to change the way that people move throughout the campus? 
what can we do with utility grade metering at 1400 points to understand if 70% is real or an estimate and what its relevance will be over the lifetime of those particular fixtures. So this is a project that yes was just deployed. So when do you want to check in with us to see how it's doing? Today and then again next year and again after that. Um, but it is a really exciting new project that I hope that um, you will be able to take a look at at some point. And just to give you an idea of what 1400 points looks like at the UC Davis campus, all those red dots are now communicating together and they are all LED. Now the campus decided to do this project, not CLTC as a guiding voice, um, so they do absorb the responsibility for it and I get the privilege of being the researcher who said hey you should try this out and then they get to, to maintain it but we're heavily invested in also using it as a test case for what can we deliver to other universities and corporate environments and all the other types of properties, municipalities that might benefit from this. And they are, this is 1400 points of bi-level lighting as well. So when you're not there the lights are at a reduced percentage. And is it a percentage that creates a gloomy and scary atmosphere for all of the different students and faculty and staff that uh, travel throughout the campus 24 hours a day? Absolutely not. But it is a reduced light level so that if you're not there, why are you using the energy to bring light to that space? And why are you putting pollution into the night sky that doesn't need to be there in the form of light? So we've also networked together all these different applications. I mean, so far we're hearing tons of buzz about street lights and LED. Well, what about wall packs? And for those of you who are new to lighting and have not yet been blessed or cursed with seeing wall packs, bollards, downlights, all these things that we don't notice because we're under the glow of these main devices, they are everywhere. And the goal is not to just select one of those, such as just the street lights. They will communicate together in a group. But instead, how about the entire network, including multiple types of devices? So wouldn't you be upset if you purchased your laptop and it refused to talk to your phone and it refused to talk to your com uh, computer in your car and you had one thing at a time? Well, we see lighting, again, part of your energy infrastructure as an integral part of things that need to communicate as a group. And there's a ton of opportunity in this. So are LEDs ready for exterior prime time? We think that that cream of the crop, top level manufacturing community that's producing uh, certain devices that are well engineered they are ready for installation right now, but it's really about the right source in the right luminaire, so carefully selecting which, which of those manufacturers you do go with to install, with the right controls, and to look at it as that systematic approach to installation. What else can it do? How else can it contribute to my uh, energy story at my institution? Moving on to interior opportunities. LED downlights. I'm going to fly through this. Don't have much time. Just want to point out some key numbers like 800 million. That's a big number. And like I said, for those of you who have never thought about a wall pack before and don't give much consideration to the circular luminaires sitting over your head in every space, from stores and retail to in your own homes, 800 million. And these were one of the first places that we saw a ton of different form factors and solutions emerge and some of them are excellent and some of them are not. Just in, with an LED downlight search in Google Images, I came back with about 1.8 million search results in just like a fraction of a second. So there are a lot out there. So you do have to choose wisely, even in the mature LED categories. And everyone in here uh, is concerned about cost. So I did want to talk a little bit about the decline of prices for quality LED products. And I'm divorcing this from brand, but had to start somewhere for an example. So just looking at this two brands and these two types, on the top row we have commercial grade, on the uh, bottom row we have the things you're going to find in Home Depot for the homeowner who wants to swap out their kitchen lighting. So in the past year, CLTC paid about $120, actually in the past few years ago, for things on the top row, and that was at a discounted price. And already over just a few years' time, we've come down $30 or $40 per unit uh, for high quality spec grade LED luminaires. And your utilities have blessed this category as ready for incentives and rebates. So thinking of retrofitting some luminaires but not others, looking at the incredible uh, 
uh, movement forward of high quality fluorescence in terms of lamp and ballast combinations and saying which are ready for LED, which are ready or, or not, and we should just look at change outs but stay in the fluorescent category. You can also look to your utility, utility catalog to say, okay, who's, who's uh, giving a rebate in which category? Adaptive stairwells. So this is the first thing a lot of persons, uh, I think, think of when it comes to facility management. And I say, let's reduce the light levels in your stairwells when no one's around. And you say, uh-oh, safety, scary. Someone's going to go in there and not want to go down the stairs, and we're going to have uh, an increase in obesity in our employee population because everyone's going to use the elevator. That's not the case, I want to assure you. Um, however, I do want to also assure you that this is a big energy opportunity, and for those of you who um, don't have the new copy of Title 24 uh, next to your uh, bedside as reading as I do, um, the bi-level stairwells or occupancy-sensitive light-reducing um, devices in stairwells is coming in terms of the next code cycle, which is coming very soon on January 1st, 2014. So in areas of low occupancy, such as stairwells, such as corridors, all these transitional paths throughout all of our built environment, um, you'd want to consider the right source, the right luminaire, the right controls for the application, and lower those light levels when no one's around. And what have we found so far? You can reduce them down to 30 or 40 percent, have plenty of illumination, and as soon as an occupant even enters the space, they're up to 100 percent anyway. If you need further evidence, as all of you will, before you made any type of buying decision rather than taking my word for it, I do have case studies to share with you if you contact me after this presentation, but I chose these nine examples with an average of 50% energy savings from the UC and CSUs. I mentioned corridors. We recently uh, did a really fabulous demonstration in Oakland that um, starts to show that the price of complicated network systems is really coming down. And we can stop using the word complicated to describe them and start to look at simple ways to bring down the cost of lighting spaces that are used 8% of the day, 10%, up to um, the busiest corridor we found so far was 50% occupied. So that means at least one person was in the hallway only 50% of the day. So as in this case study, we went from a couple years ago looking at adaptive corridors and looking at light levels reducing in corridors costing 20 to 100 years to pay back to three years and four months and only a matter of a, a, a few years. So these are ready now. And notice in this one that I don't have an LED system involved. I have a fluorescent system. So once again, for this application, fluorescent was fine. It's great. Performed beautifully. And controls were the key in this. Not moving on to tomorrow's source. And everyone in here, regardless of your lighting experience level, knows about light bulbs and is curious as to what's coming next in that category. And in this case, I wanted to mention that we are looking beyond the energy savings. In terms of CLTC's kind of next policy for just the lowly light bulb, we're looking at quality. So dimming, longevity, color, color over dimming, so when you dim it down, does it shift from a nice, comfortable white light to some eerie green thing where you see the creature on the stairwell? Um, and looking at distribution and really asking people, you know, what do they want, uh, how much are they willing to pay for it, and uh, what color do they want it to be, and looking at these other qualities. Nope, oh, that's for you later, calculations, because you all need proof. So. Um, Based on decision by the CPUC recently that includes quality of light, not just energy savings, um, and the CEC's guidance, we're hoping that the utilities, and so far they've been on board, will begin to incentivize products that meet these kind of quality-focused um, product requirements in addition to energy-focused requirements so that we can have that holistic package. I'll skip over this because there's a lot of places this is needed in retail, where the lighting directly affects the bottom line. In gallery spaces, where the intention of the whole piece is to be lit properly for viewing. And for the spaces that you're, again, like corridors and stairwells, maybe not thinking of as you sit here listening to energy efficiency policy throughout the day, all of those places that use light in the built environment, including fast food. Look at all these luminaires. Everything I've just talked about, almost you can pick out in this um, picture. So CLTC is looking at these small properties uh, throughout the state, starting with five Carl's Juniors in Southern California Edison Territory, 
LED downlights, uh, lamp retrofit, auto DR, so thinking beyond data centers and campuses and looking at even fast food institutions uh, and saying what can we do to kind of pull lighting into this whole system that combines the right source, the right luminaire, the right controls for the application at the price and the payback that you can afford now uh, and designing that system to be uh, proper and right for that place while still thinking about all these things that uh, are, are behind this from the state which you've heard a lot about today. And that's everything I have. Thanks very much, Kelly. Our, our final speaker is Tanu Mohan, and Tanu is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Enlighted. He has more than 20 years of experience in the computer, uh, computer networking and software business. And I would again refer you to the bio and the program for additional information. Tanu, it's all yours. We should have 15 minutes or so for Q&A afterwards. So I'll try and not mention LEDs throughout my so we live in an age where everything from cars to cell phones are connected, smart, and sensing. But the buildings we live in aren't. Even if you look at the building over here, there isn't any smart sensing going on. There are areas of this conference room that are empty but are controlled by one occupancy sensor somewhere. Terry said the lights are out here, the bulbs aren't actually out. Somebody is trying to do a projection scene, and somebody hit a scene button where they're trying to get this side of the conference room dim and the rest of it bright. So I'll get into it, what we do, where we come from, but keep these things in mind and I'll go forward. I think this is the presentation again. Oh, I sent a later presentation, so now it didn't seem to come. So, uh, let me just go back to the previous one. Lighting in commercial buildings consume about 28% of the electricity load. In large high rises, it's up to 44%. So somewhere between 20 to 44% of your lighting load in commercial buildings, of your electricity load in commercial buildings is lighting. So we focused on bringing controls to lighting and the way we focused about bringing controls to lighting is through smart sensing. I'm a little, uh, I don't know what the next slide is, so let me go and start from the evolution of lighting control. We started with building level sweep timer. So what a building level sweep timer does is, it tries to turn the lights off at night. So when one person comes in, works late, or the cleaning crew comes in, the lights are on. These systems had very minimal savings. We went on to room level occupancy sensing and daylight harvesting. Now look at, if I walk into my office and I'm in my, office and the lights dim on me and I have to keep waving my hands because the occupancy sensor is not picking. I call the electricians in to come fix it. The labor required, the cost of the labor required to do that fix negated any energy conservation savings you might have had. Today's systems that have come about are trying to leverage what the 80s and 90s had with zones, sweep timers, occupancy sensing, daylight harvesting. These systems, let's say I work in, I used to work at Cisco, and as I used to walk, work, walk into my cube, about half the building would light up simply because the, the, zone, the zones were very coarse. By the time I visited the restroom, most of the floor was lit. So the zone-based systems didn't work. So the natural transition of what has been happening finally is smart, is smart fixtures. So we end up, Apologize, this was not the presentation I last sent, so <laughs> I'm bringing it a little bit over here. So, Moore's Law has computers becoming so cheap that it is cost effective to put them every fixture. So now think of a fixture that is its own brain, can sense smart and make its own local decisions. That is the most optimal way of doing lighting control. Every fixture is looking at its own environment, looking at where it is and making a local optimized decision. With all of that sensor comes a lot of information. This information can feed back to a central system with which we can do a lot more. Typical systems that exist today look something like that. You have a whole bunch of SKUs 
you have a whole bunch of zones, there's a significant design and pre-engineering required, as Terry was speaking, you have to get above the ceiling and wire fixtures together, wire them to a switch, there's a significant effort involved. They require experienced contractors and finally when the system is in, there's an extensive commissioning phase where you need to figure out where the daylight harvesting sensor went. And if I pull that blind and the sensor picks it up, the entire room, then that's not effective. These finally ended up being very expensive, very complicated, with an ROI sometimes in the 8 to 12 year, 12 year range. The lack of granularity is primarily where, why we lack savings. And also, we limited the future because of the lack of granularity. Our system has smart fixtures, so we attach a sensor to every fixture that does not require the electrician to go above the ceiling tile. At every fixture, we install a power pack in line with the dimming ballast and attach an alighted sensor. The sensor looks at the current occupancy patterns, looks at the available ambient light, and makes a local optimized decision. All of the decision making is wired, so there is no <coughs> networking issue as such. Each of these sensors form a big wireless mesh, and the mesh is used for monitoring the space. A gateway converts the networking messages on the wireless to ethernet and hauls it back to an energy manager that might reside in the building or in the cloud. What this does is electricians who service the buildings today, who know how to replace bulbs and ballasts can put the system in. So it is as simple as a bulb or a ballast replacement. It is cookie cutter. So every building looks the same with this approach. We are adding smartness to each of these fixtures. In our own building, this is an example of uh, what's happening in our building. At 7 a.m., the first person comes in and by around 10 o'clock, everybody is in. That is being reflected by the orange bars, which are the actual energy consumed by the lighting system. The lighter bars on top reflect the savings. We break up the savings into occupancy savings, daylight harvesting, and task tuning. So in our own company, by around 10 a.m., most of the office is in, about 15% of the people leave for lunch. And then uh, most of the non-engineering folk leave by around 6 p.m., and then we work hard all the way up to 10 o'clock. At about 1 a.m., our cleaning crew comes in. They clean for around four hours, and then the sweep timers kick in. So if you look at this floor, we have saved about 64% over the day. And this is real. There is no calculated baseline. There is nothing. The existing systems were left in. The sweep timer is in. And whenever the existing systems kick in, we don't attribute savings to ourselves. So this is a system that does a running baseline and at any given instance tells you what would have happened and what is happening. So the data we collect could reflect itself in a heat map, in an occupancy map, in an energy map. There is a number of ways of using this data. You could use this to do you know, workplace optimization of where people are and how they work. I'll share a little story. Uh, we were in a major meeting at 9 o'clock in our boardroom and just as the meeting was about to start, we realized that our projector had gone missing. So during that meeting, everybody was allowed to pull out their laptops and supposedly follow the presentation. Curiosity got the better of me, and I ran because our system, this is our own office in Sunnyvale. And I looked what happened between midnight and 9 o'clock. At 6 a.m., we saw a pattern of somebody coming in, entering our conference room, going into an office, and leaving. So that was very suspicious, five minutes in the conference room and the projector is gone missing. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I pulled up the Outlook calendar for the person whose office it was and I saw that he had a 7 a.m. customer meeting, which was offsite. So he had come in at 6 o'clock, taken the projector and gone. So while the meeting was going on, I said that you know, about in 10 minutes, the projector will show up again. So around at 9.40, the projector came in. So what I was trying to get at is, you install a lighting control system, and this is all what you got. The energy efficiency from the lighting control system delivered a two-year ROI paid for all of this. Thank you.
Thank you, Turner. Um, before I ask any questions or ask you to ask the panelists questions, I'm going to ask them, uh, Terry Kelly and Turner, to if you if you have any questions of your fellow panelists, why don't you go ahead and have at each other, um, <laughs> and then we'll eventually turn it over to the folks in the in the room. Well, let, let me just explain why I, I seem to be such a, a, a hard, factual-driven guy on this uh, uh, best lighting practices. And, and any of you who have dealt with a building and dealt with an architect, there's a certain budget and you spend so much on the, the carpeting and so much on the sheetrock and so much on the lighting, so much on the control systems. When, when you do best practices and you start getting the lighting power density down to about point uh, five watts a square foot, and then you take simple controls. Uh, the connected load best practice CLTC starts coming in around 0.35 watts a square foot. So if I could cut that by another two tenths of a watt, I'm at a 0.15 watts a square foot, and that's only worth about five dollars a year per light fixture. So the percentage savings is great, but even at 15 cents a kilowatt hour, it's very, very hard to get excited about the long-term payback versus insulated windows versus uh, all the other things you're hearing about. And so the, 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 the challenge, and it's some of the things that uh, Beck and this group, Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change, is, is what are the barriers that are keeping us as a state from using best practices? Because many of you heard Title 24, uh, that caps energy use at nine tenths of a watt a square foot. So the gap between what the state has proven as best practice and what we allow under law is is two x, and and that is just there if we could change our behaviors. So that that's why that's it's such an economic driving force. Terry, do you have any questions of your fellow panelists, or Tanu, or Kelly, of your fellow panelists? Yeah, not at this time, I think. Uh, Come on, we had, guys, we had be brave, the, be brave. <laughs> As a preparation, we had that out. <laughs> we <laughs> went after each other. But, okay. but if, you, no, if nobody else has any questions, if you don't have questions yeah, but, of your fellow panelists, then yeah, I would ask you to use the microphone here in addressing the panelists. Just one quick question for... Um, if you could oh, identify who you're with in your uh, name, please. Mike Petahoff from Apple. Uh, just the uh, speaker from, is it Enlightened, I guess? Enlightened. Uh, are your systems uh, equally applicable for fluorescent and LED systems? Yes. So that's something that happened. The cost of dimming on fluorescent has plummeted significantly. So it makes a lot of sense to dim fluorescent fixtures. So we have about 80% of our installations are with fluorescent fixtures, 20% with LEDs. With the new... Uh, Program start Dallas. It does not matter the life of the LED of the fluorescents aren't affected at all, and it's very smooth. Kelly, do you have any thoughts about that from the standpoint of the UC Davis lighting center? Well, you I, want think, to add? I think what I said in my presentation still applies. Is that um, you know, it's you know even even the incandescent has a place in select applications. So, you know, um, the systems like Enlighted, the systems that are controlling both exterior and interior environments, good systems should be source independent and they should instead um, operate that they are going to control and offer data points that are useful to the end user. So um, technology neutrality and, and looking at source is, is so critical and not to get swept up in a paradigm shift that's only now starting to, to, to really uh, take place. Okay. Uh, further questions from the floor, please. Um, yeah. Name, I, name I, and company. I'm Chris McCloskey. I'm with uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, in their consulting business. Um, I had a question just about the, the end users and all this, right? the, the people who are actually sitting in the offices in their homes with the new lighting technology. Um, I recently burned out two CFL bulbs in a row before I realized that the dimmer switch in my bedroom was actually causing the CFLs to burn out. Uh, then I bought a dimmable CFL with flickers. Um, in replacing all those, I broke one of the CFLs and spent some time cleaning it up and wiping it down to make sure that you know, the hazardous chemicals in there weren't you know, in my home. Um, so I wonder, when you're thinking about the end users, 
how do you sell the benefits to them and how do you educate them on you know, the new lighting technologies, changes to their fixtures, changes to how these lights behave and how they have to be used, how they have to be disposed of. When you think about the end users, just how do you educate that, that group? Well, it's actually not much different from CFTC's standpoint on educating a facility manager, or I'd like to say it's knowledge exchange more so than just education. We're not here to deliver the end all and be all. We're constantly looking to end users, whether they be someone in a home or someone who's managing a million square feet of corporate campus and saying, what do you need? Um, but at the same time, we ask them to look at emerging technologies and say, if you're looking for something new for your home that's going to save energy and you're doing all these things for the right reasons, that you not ask that that new lamp that you're purchasing be $1 when it really needs to be $10 or $15 at the outset of when it's introduced in the market in order to perform up to the expectations that you are hoping will happen. So, for example, all of you may consider in the next um, year or two investing in a solid state replacement lamp, a regular old um, LED light bulb. Well, if you go to the bargain rack and buy the bargain one, uh, well, you might just get something that uh, doesn't last. And, and with the CFLs, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of information that was put out there at the outset. Um, there was so much focus on cost and so much focused on suppressing that at any cost, including the cost of the ballast components uh, and, and lack of knowledge out there about dimmer compatibility, that we, oh, we, we missed an opportunity. And for this emerging technology phase that we're in right now, it's that the consumer be open to learning, uh, that the institution be open to giving knowledge exchange, but also that you remember that you get what you pay for as we move forward and, and not demand as consumers that everything be bargain basement price and then ask it to perform like you know um, a Tesla versus a Pinto. So I don't know if that directly answered your question, um, but I'm trying to touch on all these points. Yes, we're listening to what consumers want because we're consumers ourselves, thus the quality of light standard we hope comes to pass. But at the same time, we need consumers to come back and say, you know what, sometimes it costs more to have what I need and to have it function as uh, purported for that 15 years that's promised by the manufacturer. Next next question, please. Uh, identify yourself and your... Uh, Wei Li, uh, I am uh, myself. I'm an environmentalist. Oh, well, I, I, I care about my planet Earth. Uh, question for the enlightened uh, uh, sensors and and a reporting system, and uh, how much uh, uh, how much power does it consume? Um, my bottom point is I want to know whether this could be fit for residential application. And then my second question is for Terry. Uh, do you have some plug and play kind of LED in stuff? I have to do the driver change, I have to do the bullet change, you know, those kind of things. Two questions. Thank you. So in operating mode, it is at 120 volts. It's sub half a watt. When it is in full operation. For, so again, it depends what it's doing. But for a hundred square foot, it's about sub half a watt. And Jerry. Yeah, uh, I can speak for our company, Fine Light. We we really strive to make all the pieces uh, repairable. So you, you don't have to throw them away. It's got a low footprint. Uh, there is a table out there. I would encourage you to, to grab your uh, uh, wine and take a look at it. My apology. I didn't make my question okay. clear. I'm talking about the conversion from the existing fluorescent to LED. Could you make it plug and play, you know, take it out and play instead of changing the driver and bullets? No. <laughs> oh. But but I did uh, I just for your information my house was built with uh, uh, incon incandescent light very very bad and then when I find out about you know all this LED I'm able to buy LED that has two pin I think G8 I forgot what's the yeah and I, I it's plug and play I don't need to change anything and I got a really good uh, lumen. In, in the residential world, that works pretty well. In the commercial world, the, the nature of these long four-foot lamps above your head, 
they, they never see building power. There's always a ballast in between them. So it's, it's a little more complicated to, to change out this luminaire above but your head. The than, same than thing with my uh, residential one. It was in a can that, you know, some, some LED company required that you change the can. I don't have to change the can. The, the short answer is yes, there are products out there that do what you're looking for. Um, but yes, I'm using it. Uh, but it, it's understanding kind of what's out there and making a proper selection. Um, but there are products out there that I think are doing exactly what, what you want. But yeah, I know I'm using it. So educate me. So, what so, is the difference? Okay, between so if you look at that down light, let's take that as an example. If that was in your kitchen, the lamp you had was probably self ballasted. So when you remove the lamp, you've removed the ballast. But that particular one in this room probably has a ballast that is separate from the lamp. So if you remove the lamp, the ballast is still in line. So yeah. when you put in an LED fixture, the way the ballast works is it's trying to do something. It's trying to drive current. It has to strike the lamp. So there, is, there are voltage and electric curves in the beginning that would typically harm an LED. And if you did have a solution, he has worked around that. So you have the inefficiency of that ballast. Then you have the inefficiency of the LED driver in it. So it's not the right way to do an LED. I see. It's possible, but it's not the right way to do it. I if, see. if I could, Thank we've you. only got a couple of minutes Thank left you. and we've got a whole series of questions here. So if I could ask the next, per next person, please. Um, Meredith Owens, Alameda Municipal oh. Power. And we've had an LED advanced technology program for about three years now in both sectors. The rebate rate is 20 cents a kilowatt hour. We're getting some uh, frustrated, some of our customers are getting frustrated with um, the Design Lights Consortium Qualified Products List and the Energy Star Qualified Products List. What we're finding is um, you, you'll go to a manufacturer's website and it'll have the Energy Star label on it, but it's not in the Energy Star list. And it, it, it seems that the Energy Star list, um, although it's certainly a daunting task to update that, is probably not updated. And some things are on Design Lights and they're not on Energy Star, so. Well, you're, you're right. And Energy Star uh, is now part of the EPA. Uh, it appears to us as a manufacturer, it's going more and more for residential more and more focused on things you buy at a big box store, a, a Target, a, a Safeway, a Home Depot. Uh, Energy Star for someone like NetApp or Stanford, uh, once you get out of the little six inch tube, they explicitly exclude these two by two fixtures and two by fours. So we are not allowed to be part of the Energy Star program. And that's why your customers need to look to two different standards. If it's the classroom, commercial world, I'm sorry, you have to go to DLC because the EPA won't let us in. Yeah, it's been very frustrating. Uh, maybe their best bet is to just ask for LM79 and LM80 if it's not, ev if it's not evident. Do you have any comment on that, Kelly? Um, well, we do advocate for the development of a specification that uh, at especially the mun municipal utility level as well as the large IOU level that will kind of filter some of those products through, um, but that way your large end users could use those specifications to kind of filter, but they, they do have to do that work of filtering it. Um, but you're right, these lists are hard to update, and because we over the past five years have seen just an enormous influx of products into this market because of the addition of the solid state competitors, um, it's been impossible to uh, audit all of those lists. However, with that said, CLTC is not funded one dime right now to do that type of work no, for DOE. I, I, I know, um, I know. <laughs> and we also have our issues with um, the way those systems are run. But the DLC for commercial products is, is the, the place that utilities and so on are looking right now. But developing localized specifications that help um, agencies, large clients, et cetera, kind of filter products for themselves as well through the contracting <laughs> process might be a good solution. One tiny little thing on that, the nomenclature in the model numbers and so forth is, is just out there. <laughs> I, I think I recognize this next individual. Thank you very you much. Please uh, identify yourself. I'm Mukesh Kurta with Oracle and uh, thank you very much. It's a very good presentation from all of you. Talk to you individually some time ago, but really enjoyed it. So all of you really were telling about the virtues of dimming one way or the other. So my question is, I have two questions. One first question is, where do you see 
self contained fixtures with dimming capability for areas like transition areas or either that they are not fully occupied and do they become cost effective that's the first question and the second question is if you all had your ways five years from now what kind of a lighting system do you see in the industry will how will it be different than what we see in the industry today why don't i start with terry on that one yeah, if you're not aware, uh, the current generation of Title 24, which is the law in California by 2013, is going to mandate all of the luminaires in the commercial world will have dimming. So whether they're LED or fluorescent, uh, that is going to become the law. So demand response, dimming, all of that will become standard. So in five years, we will all be used to dimming luminaires in every office, every classroom, every hospital room, it'll be there by law. Uh, and, and I'll pass on how smart fixtures are gonna be uh, to, to my colleagues up here. So um, the uh, question you first asked is tied to the question that you asked second. And um, CLTC does see uh, an increase in the number of luminaires available by high quality manufacturers that have onboard sensing um, onboard controls so that you buy one and you install it and it does the things that you need to do for daylit zones, for dimming, etc. Uh, I mean occupancy based dimming. But then you're also going to have the second category of pairing control systems with existing um, fixtures that don't have these types of onboard smarts. So in five years, as Terry said, I see more smart systems and I see two avenues to get there. One, it's on board, and two, you take whatever you want and pair it with either a system that's connected to your whole building through a network or a system that's just controlling your lighting. And it depends on you know your level of investment and your need for all of this granular data that's being collected. Because not every business out there needs to know as much as a 1,400 points of light on the UC Davis campus is gonna deliver. So you can start to see a decision tree that's evolving based on what we have now what will be here in, in five years, so. Yeah, in five market. years, I more or less see smart fixtures being sold. These fixtures have sensing inbuilt in them, as well as a network component, so, and they would be plug and play with existing systems. And I also hope that in five years, we start to see the reaction to these systems in spaces. The acceptance of uh, this dimming that's gonna be required by law by persons who are using stairwells and corridors who are currently saying, you know, what's, what's this all about? Is it dark and scary? Is it enhancing security or compromising it? Uh, I'll, but, I'll take that one. We are actually seeing it. Uh, we have over 3 million square feet in stock. And the first thing was that I'm sitting alone in my cube at night and all the lights around me are dimmed. I feel scared. In fact, we said, let's turn them off. And she said, what? I said, turn them off. And then when somebody approaches, she starts hearing the lights come on and it is evident to her that somebody is approaching her well in advance of a full lit building. So after some time, because you can't hide from these sensors, it actually feels a lot more secure. The security personnel actually come into our floor, they take one scan and they know if the space is empty or there's one person sitting in a cube at one end and he walks to him. Both the security guy knows what he's going to expect and the person in the cube knows what he's going to expect. And both of them are waiting, hello, okay, and they move on. So some of the concerns are actually what people think are actually working in the reverse. Stairwells, for example, because they are networked, you can walk in and trigger the entire stairwell from floor zero to floor 100. And that's the network would do that. A smart network would do that. So many of these concerns, because there are there is an upgradable brain in every fixture, you can add software, and they are networked, you can more or less do anything you want. So. We, individuals in our offices can adjust their particular fixture to the level they like. So once that's done, they come in, the fixtures remember them. If they move to a, if they're doing hoteling and they move to another office, their preferences move with them. So in some sense, the shackles of what the building had have been completely removed and everything is now fluid. Yeah, maybe it, the, some of the simplest answers will be, like, um, all this building is entirely smart, so just give me something simple that I can control, and maybe it'll just be the demand for task lights so that I have something small on my desk to bring light off or on. So as we get more complex digitally, maybe we'll get a little bit more um, clear on what we need for just manual on-off as well. 
Okay, if, if I could at this point, we've got two remaining questions. I hope they can be short and we'll just have one person respond. We're right at the end and the next session is getting ready to start. So, Nathan? Okay, uh, yeah, Nathan Fleischer with Apple and a UC Davis grad. So, I have a question about LED lights. You know, they're getting a lot more efficient and cost effective, but we've had some uh, negative feedback about the color temperature with, with glare and so forth. and. I just wanted to ask the panel if you had any experience with working with occupants and have, getting them to adopt that color temperature or mitigating them some, somewhat. Nathan, could I just ask you to clarify one thing? Uh, LED lighting as an industry is getting so big when people say we don't like LED lights, uh, people need to think, are you talking about in the home, uh, in, in your retail store, yeah. in the office, which that's, that's which fair. area are, are they not happy? I'd say more in a, office or conference room environment just for the sake of this question. Uh, what, so, what we have found is that a few of the uh, uh, LED based luminaires first generation came out are extremely glary. Uh, the LEDs were not very efficient. They did anything they could to get the light out of it. So they didn't have very good shielding. They didn't have very good color control. So you may be working with a, a pretty early generation and those can't be fixed. Uh, that was the best they could do at that time. But I would, I would check glare, color consistency, better quality luminaires in the office don't have that problem anymore. And the good news is uh, we're absolutely looking at it as an industry and we're, we're thrilled to have to tackle the question of how nuanced can you get within a system that addresses things like color for an individual at their desk because LEDs can do that. And we want to move in that direction where you can dial in just what you need according to why you need it, whether it's a biological connection to circadian rhythm or you just see better with a higher correlated color temperature light when you're doing a fine, fine contrast task. So yes, we're looking at it. And I, in five years, I hope the discussion is even more developed around that topic. Yeah, so it, just yeah, quickly add yeah. occupancy change. So if you change the color temperature on them, and we have had that, we had warm light throughout, and we went to a much lower light. Immediately, everybody said, it's so bright, I'm getting a headache. And when you look at the foot candles, it actually went down. So it is change that people see in the lighting, mostly. So if you keep the lighting the same, they rarely notice it. And if it's going to be better, you need to tell them upfront it's going to be better. So that <laughs> their brain works that way. Otherwise, change is always is not good. Uh, if we could, one last question, please. Please uh, identify yourself. Uh, Sue Degree, City Council of Pacifica. Can any of you lead me to Barini traffic lights? Are there any such things as traffic lights that are kind of 21st century that can traffic be Traffic lights or city street lights? No, not city street lights. Traffic flow. Traffic flow lights. So, I know what can be done and what should be done. I used to be at a wireless mesh company where we had wireless mesh routers sitting on each of the traffic lights and we were able to back all the data. Had that had a sensor in real time, we could actually help optimize the lights based on real time traffic, but I don't know of a system out there that has brought these concepts together yet. May I encourage you all to get busy? <laughs> <laughs> If, if you would, please, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists, Terry, Kelly.